Breakups are tough. There is no getting around that fact. Sure, sometimes you may get back together, but you have to be fully accepting that your ex may want to go their separate ways. Free to live a new life that just doesn't have you in it. But what happens when someone just can't let it go? If they can't have them, nobody can. Viewer discretion is advised for this educational documentary. Welcome or welcome back to Dark Case Documentaries. I bring you true crime, disturbing stories and other things that you may later regret knowing with regular uploads every week. Join the quickly growing Dark Case family by hitting subscribe now and turning on notifications. Thank you so much to all of my patrons. If your name is on screen right now, then you're a legend. Our love and respect goes out to all those that knew and loved Emma and all those affected by this dark case. Emma Jane Walker was born on March the 20th, 2000 to parents Jill and Mark Walker. She was a long-awaited blessing. They had always wanted a baby girl and they always knew that they would call her Emma. Emma grew up in Knoxville, Tennessee with her little brother named Evan. She was a loving and well-loved young person. From her freshman year at Central High School, she joined the cheerleading team. Emma really took cheerleading seriously. She didn't just like doing it, it was a passion and she was great at it. She loved being part of a team and she loved football games. On the sidelines cheering for the Bobcats was where 14-year-old Emma caught the eye of wide receiver number 8, Riley Gore. Riley was a junior in high school who was raised by his mother and his grandparents. Despite living in a city where Friday night football was everything, Riley really wasn't your classic jock. He was a funny and intelligent young man, someone who loved to play video games and he really did have a nerdy side. When him and Emma eventually started dating, her parents were pleased. He was someone that Mark and Jill thought was a great fit for their daughter. He was very likeable. He was well-mannered and a nice-looking young man. Soon, her social media accounts were filled with pictures of them paddleboarding together, embracing and taking silly selfies. They seemed from the outside like the perfect pair, but Emma's friends and family soon realised that Riley had a dark side. Behind closed doors, Riley wasn't as perfect as he first appeared. He got more possessive and clingy towards Emma. He wouldn't let her do certain things, not wanting Emma to hang out with anyone but him. He also would comment on what Emma wore, dictating on what she could and couldn't put on. Their two-year relationship was nothing short of tumultuous. Emma and Riley would often have dramatic fights and would frequently break up. Riley took to social media, sending Emma horrible messages on Snapchat such as I hate you, I hate everything about you and you're the biggest bitch I've ever come into contact with. You're dead to me, I'll check the obituary. But teenage love is fickle and as quickly as they'd break up, they would then get back together with Riley love bombing her. Parents Mark and Jill however were now less than impressed. Emma had shown them some of these vile messages. They immediately banned Riley from their home and took away Emma's cell phone. They'd seen a change in their daughter when she was with Riley, and this change wasn't a good one. In their eyes, he wasn't right for Emma. In the fall of 2016, Riley went off to Maryville College, just 17 miles south of Knoxville. This left Emma just starting her junior year in high school. Mark and Jill decided to resort to drastic measures. They grounded their daughter in an attempt to keep the couple apart. She was not allowed to leave the house unless it was for school, work or cheerleading. But to their surprise, Emma realised that she did indeed deserve much better than Riley. Around Halloween time that year, Emma decided that she had had enough of their dysfunctional relationship. She ended things with Riley once and for all. 
Little by little, her parents began seeing changes in their daughter. She was turning back into the old Emma now that she was out from under Riley's thumb. She would come out of her room, eat dinner and socialise with the family, something she hadn't done for a long time. However, kind of predictably, this breakup didn't sit well with Riley. He took drastic measures to get Emma's attention, and this wasn't just repeated phone calls. There was an attempt on his own life, and an occasion where, bizarrely, he faked his own kidnapping. Yes, you heard me right. Emma was at a party at a friend's house. She was loving her newfound freedom without Riley breathing down her neck. At around 11.30pm, however, Emma received a text message from an anonymous number. The message read, Go to your car with your keys. Go alone. I've got someone you love. If you don't comply, I will hurt them eventually. There were more messages and they got more and more menacing. Another one read, If you'd like to hear his crying and screams, give him a call. However, Emma wasn't dumb. She just suspected that maybe Riley had something to do with this, especially since he knew she was out at a party enjoying herself. Emma and her friends then went outside. There they saw Riley laying face down in a ditch. Now guys, I know I shouldn't laugh at this stuff, but if you actually picture this happening, it is absolutely crazy and undeniably pretty funny. Anyway, back to the case. Riley then claimed that he'd been kidnapped, but he couldn't remember anything about it because his captives had hit him on the head. But, obviously, Emma wasn't buying any of his story. She knew that this was a cry for attention and she just walked away. She left Riley stood there looking foolish. Riley didn't take this as a sign to give up, however. The very next day, Emma saw a man dressed in black outside of her house. Terrified, she reached out to the only person she knew that she thought could help, Riley Gall. She said to him, I hate you, but I need you right now. To which he replied, I'm coming, I'm speeding, just give me a minute. When mother Jill Walker arrived home just a short time after, she saw Emma outside with Riley. And remember, Riley was banned from their house, so she was understandably furious. Jill demanded that he leave and she suggested to Emma that the man in black had probably just been Riley all along. And I for one agree with Jill. Afterwards, Emma texted her friends. She said, I'm home alone and somebody in black walked down my street and came to my door and rang the doorbell over and over again. I thought I was going to die. Little did Emma know of the foreshadowing that this message held. The following day, November the 20th, Emma went to her Sunday shift at a supermarket in town. Her parents followed her to work and back to ensure that she was safe. They did this because Riley had a history of waiting around for her in the parking lot. Apparently, he would just wait outside for hours. But on this occasion, he didn't. And later that night, things seemed to go back to normal at the Walker household. Emma texted her friend about a homework assignment. Then she went to bed a little after midnight. Sadly, this was the last time that her parents would ever see her alive. At 6am on Monday, November the 21st, Jill went into Emma's room to wake her up for school. Emma was unresponsive. As she got closer, this mother realised her beautiful daughter wasn't just sleeping late. In fact, she wasn't sleeping at all. Emma Walker was unresponsive and no longer breathing. I just tried to wake up my daughter for school and she has no pulse. She's 16! You said that she's non-responsive? Yeah, her tank's hanging out of her mouth. Stay on, stay on the line, I'm transferring you to Royal Metro. Emma's light had been snuffed out by a projectile from a firearm to the head. One single bullet had hit her behind her left ear, and a second bullet was lodged into her pillow. In total, two bullets had been fired into her bedroom from outside the family's single-storey home. 
further investigation revealed two shell casings a yard outside. An officer on a case, Lieutenant Alan Merritt, started interviewing friends and family members and noted that the same name was coming up over and over again. This name, obviously, Riley Gall. Meanwhile, Riley was busy posting on Facebook and Twitter about Emma's passing. Rest easy now, sweetheart, he wrote in one tweet, and I love you forever and always in another. Despite Riley's performative posts, investigators quickly brought him in for questioning. Detective James Hurst said, When I first met him, I thought he might have been a grieving boyfriend. But when we got into the interview room and sat down, I felt like there was a dark side. He didn't have a whole lot of passion or concern. Before we get started, I uh, understand you're not under arrest right now. You came down on your free and with your granddad and your mom. But because you're in a secure area, I have to read you your rights, okay? Uh, because basically if you're in a position that you can't get up and leave and get out on your own, they technically look at that in court as being in custody. But understand you're not in custody. I've not put handcuffs on you. I've not told you you've been charged with anything like It's just a film while we're waiting on him, tell me a little bit about yourself. I know obviously you played uh, football at Maryville College. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming you played football in high school. Yes. What position? Wide receiver, cornerback, punt returner, kick returner, punter. Must be pretty good. Yeah. And she was she was kind of acting frantic over the phone, and she said that someone was trying to get into her house. Somebody was dressed in all black. They had a face mask on. She said that she saw him. She said she thought they were just taking a walk in the neighborhood, and then when she passed them to pull into her driveway, they put on a pair of glasses, and they started, like, she said they kind of, like, sped up, so she went into the garage and shut the garage, and that's when I dropped all the stuff I was at in my stepdad's house and drove all the way to her neighborhood. Did you have, did you say she texted you that information? She, or just, she texted me, like, she was asking if it was me at first, mm -hmm. and I told her, no, what's going on, and that's when she FaceTime called me. She was crying and freaking out, so I said, okay, give me a minute, I'll come down there and check it out. I, uh, I went to her backyard, made sure, you know, nobody was back there, checked under the porch and everything. Mm -hmm. um, looked up and down the street, 4.30, I fell asleep, uh, fell asleep around then, and that's when I woke up to people calling me about what had happened. Well, first he, he had texted me, and he was like, hey, man, I'm sorry about what happened. So I was like, what are you talking about? And he called me after that, and he said, did you not hear what happened? I said, no, what are you talking about? And he said, uh, they found Emma dead in her bed this morning, or unresponsive is what he told me. And that's when I started uh, freaking out, having a breakdown. So my parents, or my mom and my grandmother, were coming out to campus to get me. They probably got there around 9-ish. 9.30, somewhere around there. Tell me, tell me what you know about Emma's uh, passing. I know there's been all kinds of rumors and speculation. What have you heard? I've tried to, but in between all of it out, because I've heard so many different things. I've heard she just passed in her sleep. I heard she tried to commit. I heard a stray bullet came to the wall, but that made no sense to me because it's her room, if a stray bullet hit the wall, it would have to be from the backyard because that's where her window is. No, it, it, I don't know, that one didn't make sense to me, but those are the main three. Riley told the police that he'd been trying to speak with Emma that weekend, but allegedly she refused to engage with him until he helped her write a paper. He went on to claim that on Sunday night, he used one of his friend's phones on campus to call her. He said that this conversation didn't go very well. Supposedly, Emma blocked the number after she was abusive towards Riley. Afterwards, Riley told detectives he went over to his grandparents' house, but he said it was only a brief visit and then he drove back to his college. Once he was there, he said he cried in his car for two or three hours before going to bed. Riley's interview was disconnected. It seemed rehearsed and deliberate, but although the interview was indeed suspicious, police had no solid evidence that they could use to arrest Riley. That was until two of Riley's close friends gave detectives the break that they needed. Riley's college friends Alec McCarty and Nora Walton 
quickly told investigators that Riley had displayed some concerning actions ever since Emma had broken up with him. They told them all about the fake kidnapping incident and the harassment, but they also had information that proved to be paramount to the case. On Saturday, November the 19th, the very day after Riley's fake kidnapping, he told Alex that he stole his grandfather's gun, a 9mm Glock pistol, in order to protect himself. However, his grandfather stored the gun in his car and actually reported this gun missing. Riley later asked Noah how to get fingerprints off of the gun, and he then eventually asked both of these friends to help him dispose of the weapon. Riley swore to his friends that he had not killed Emma, but he wanted to toss the gun into the Tennessee River because he was worried the police would unfairly connect him to the crime if they ever learned that he had it. When questioned about the gun, Riley claimed that he didn't know where it was. He denied showing it to Alex, and he also denied asking Noah about removing the fingerprints. The evidence was damning, but detectives wanted a smoking gun, so to speak. Alex and Noah agreed to team up with investigators to reveal the truth. And like something from a movie, they were fitted with cameras and microphones. And then they participated in a sting operation. During this operation, they accompanied Riley to dump the gun that he'd used to kill Emma. What you are about to see is really some of the most crazy footage I've ever seen. Sorry about him, dog. I can't, I really, I want to be so upset, I can't because I'm really putting away from murder that I did. Never in my life would I kill someone that I love that much. Love you, bro. It sucks you gotta deal with all this. Trusting you guys, like, with my life, because, I mean, this is 70 years in jail if I get convicted of something I didn't do. So why can't you just give me a gun? Just, it just needs to be gone. For whatever reason, just it just needs to be gone. You guys don't have to come with me if you don't want to. I mean, I got your back, man. If it's in the Tennessee River, they will never find it. With the help of Riley's friends, police were able to intervene. They found Riley not only in possession of the murder weapon, but also the black clothing that the man was wearing outside of Emma's house. Riley was caught red-handed. He was arrested and charged with ending the life of his girlfriend, Emma Walker. Riley went on trial in May of 2018. His defence attorney, Wesley Stone, argued in court that he never meant to kill Emma, but he had fired the gun to try to scare her and get her attention. Stone also stated that Riley denied being the mysterious man dressed in black. He said in court, He never intended to cause her harm, never intended to cause her death. After just five hours of deliberation, jurors found Riley guilty of first-degree homicide as well as stalking, theft, reckless endangerment, and being in possession of a firearm during a dangerous felony. In the state of Tennessee, a first-degree murder conviction carries an automatic life sentence. However, Riley's sentence allows a possibility of parole after 51 years. The sentence imposed for the additional convictions adds up to a little more than a decade. However, these sentences will run at the same time as the life sentence. Essentially, they are purely symbolic. At his sentencing hearing, Riley told Emma's family that he wanted to scare her. I never meant to take Emma's life. Words that obviously offered no comfort to those that loved Emma so dearly. Do you think the punishment fits the crime here? What do you think could be done to avoid something like this happening again in the future? Please do let me know down in the comments. And remember, if you appreciate what I'm doing here, please do hit the like button. Be careful out there and I'll see you 